Given that today is October 7th, the one-year anniversary of the Hamas attack on Israel, I guess it's not surprising that most media outlets, most governments in the West are making very dramatic gestures, taking very extreme steps in order to commemorate the October 7th attack in the most conspicuous and dramatic manner. All sorts of political leaders meeting with Jewish, uh, b Jewish uh, leaders in the community, religious figures, all sorts of joint U.S.-Israeli commemoration of October 7th, and the U.S. media is doing what it did one year ago, which is focusing on this event as though it's some kind of world historic, unprecedented event, the likes of which, in terms of just pure evil, has never previously been seen. Here's the New York Times today, quote, title, one year later, we're covering the anniversary of the October 7th attack and how it has reshaped the Middle East. Quote, many Israeli families were starting their weekend routines on a Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath, one year ago, when the first times of trouble appeared. Hamas sent explosive drones and fired thousands of rockets from Gaza into Israel. Soon after, militants smashed through border fences out of Gaza and landed in southern Israel on paragliders. They killed more than 1,100 people and took hundreds more hostages, broadcasting some of the attacks on social media. The October 7th attack, among the deadliest acts of terrorism in history, has reshaped the Middle East in the years since. Here's the Washington Post's obligatory uh, commemoration from October 7th as well today, quote, Israelis still at war pause to remember the attacks of one year ago. Quote, Israeli communities near the Gaza Strip awoke Monday to air raid sirens as they did on October 7th, 2023, during the surprise attacks by Hamas fighters. The Wall Street Journal, October 7th, one year after October 7th, Israel sees a future at war. Quote, the Hamas-led attack has convinced the country that it must take the battle to all of its enemies. Now, one of the things that happens in terms of how propaganda functions in the West, in the United States, I presume it happens the same way in, say, Eastern countries or Middle Eastern countries. I'm just not as familiar with those because I don't live in those countries. I haven't studied those quite as much. But one of the key propagandistic tactics whenever some kind of violence is about to ensue, some kind of war, is on the table that's likely to be sold is that there's an attempt to pick an arbitrary date in history when this conflict began, before which everything else was nothing but peace and rainbows and love. And then out of nowhere, this singular act of violence took place. And it not only justified, but basically made inevitable everything that followed from those who were attacked. This, of course, is what happened on September 11th when as we've covered many times, all of those Americans wanted to know, rightfully so, what did we do in the world that makes these people hate us so much? Why do they want to kill us so much? And of course, there was all kinds of evidence for many years about why there was intense anti-American sentiment, uh, American, uh, anti sentiment in the region. All of the military campaigns that we did there, all of the sanctions we imposed, the overthrowing of the democratic governments, the bombing, the putting American uh, troops on Saudi soil, the constant arming of Israel to attack Palestinians and his other neighbors, just the decades of interference in that region, very violent and very brutal, ones that killed all sorts of innocent people, including countless Muslim children. And had Americans been aware of that, there would have been no question, oh, why did they hate us and why, why did they attack us? The answer would have been clear. Oh, this is retaliation in their eyes for everything that we've been doing. And you can go and listen to every single terror as, uh, suspect, anyone who carried out a terrorist uh, attack on the United States after September 11th, obviously nowhere near of the magnitude, but there were some, there were other plots that were broken up. And I remember a lot of times watching the legal proceedings where these detained terrorists were brought to trial and these federal judges sitting in the Southern District of New York would look at them with so much bewilderment and disgust and say, okay, you wanted to plant a bomb in Times Square? How about all of the innocent children you were going to kill in this cause that you thought was so important or these innocent people? And he looked at her and he said, 
What about all the innocent children and all the innocent people that you've been killing for decades in our country with airstrikes and with drones and with a nonstop uh, arsenal of violence that you've been dropping on our country? This is just the first time violence has been brought back to your own. And of course, you don't have to think that terrorism is morally justified, as we said on the night we came back from October 7th, which is October 9th. You can never, in my view, justify the targeting of civilians. But treating civilians as casual collateral damage is something that is central to American doctrine. In fact, in the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing, where Timothy McVeigh, who was convicted of that bombing, said that the reason he was doing so was in retaliation of a government that had become tyrannical, as evidenced by, in his view, the attack on Waco, where they basically incinerated David Koresh and the Branch Davidians and killed dozens of children inside in the name of saving them, or Ruby Ridge, where they went to a white separatist far uh, branch in, in I Idaho, even though he wasn't doing anything wrong, and killed his wife and dog and shot at his son. That was part of this anti-government movement in the 90s, and Timothy, Timothy McVeigh bombed the Oklahoma City Federal Building in response as a, what he viewed as a counter uh, attack against the US government that had been attacking its own citizens. And obviously the question that everybody asked was there were a lot of civilians inside that building who ended up dying, including a nursery full, school full of children. And they said, okay, even if you think your cause was just, why don't you direct your violence more carefully? Why would you be willing to risk killing innocent people? And he said that I learned that in the military. We call that collateral damage. That wasn't what I was trying to do. I wasn't trying to kill babies. I was trying to blow up a US government facility because in my view, they'd become so tyrannical. That was the only choice. They were using violence against their own people. And I was taught to look at unintended deaths like that as collateral damage. It's just the problem is when you're drain, drowning in nationalistic or Western propaganda, the central foundational Strategy is to ensure that the standards we impose on other people never get applied to our own conduct. And that's what ends up being so distorting. So Americans were convinced to believe that the conflict between the United States and the Middle East began only on September 11th when we were just unjustly out of nowhere attacked, even though we were nothing but peacefully minding our own business. And so they created this arbitrary date, October 11th, uh, September 11th, that was supposed to have be, been the start of the conflict between the Middle East and the United States. And so everything we did after that was just a response or a retaliation uh, in, in response to that, uh, that initial attack, when in fact that conflict had been going about, back decades. It just took all that time for it to get to American soil. Instead of just having the United States blow up people in that part of the world, they finally were able to inflict a strike on us. But that couldn't be the realization that people had because then they would have begun questioning, well, why are we in that part of the world? Why are we doing that? And of course, that's exactly why when last year young people on Twitter started discovering the Bin Laden letter where he sets out all of those grievances that not Al Qaeda, but that people in the Middle East, Muslims and Arabs have toward the United States and he listed all of those policies of overthrowing their governments, of killing their children, with sanctions regimes of arming the Israelis to dominate and kill Palestinians. That's when young people started saying, wait, I didn't know any of this history. This isn't what was taught to me. And that's why they had to ban any discussion of that on TikTok and remove the Bin Laden letter from one of the only places on the internet where it was, which was The Guardian, because that information is too dangerous because it gives historical context and perspective to what is being presented as this moralistic good versus evil narrative and fairy tale that requires people to believe that history only began on that day, that prior to that, there was nothing but peace. Everybody was just minding their own business. Saw something very similar. If you ask people, when did the Russian invasion of Ukraine begin? When did the war begin? They'll tell you, oh, that was February 2nd, 2024, 2022, when the Russian Military marched into Ukraine unprovoked and they started a war of aggression. When in reality, if you go back 
not even a decade, there was immense amounts of conflict and tension between Russia on the one hand and NATO on the other concerning the single most sensitive spot in the Russian border, which is the Ukrainian border that was twice used by the Germans in the 20th century to attack and invade Russia, inflicting on them tens of millions of deaths of their own citizens from which they are still traumatized today. And the view of the Russians is that was always agreed that NATO would never remove, move eastward once we agreed to allow Germany to reunify after the fall of the Soviet Union. And Germany has done nothing but NATO has done nothing but expand right up to our borders, but Ukraine is the place we're drawing the line. And of course, there was a coup, a U.S. supported coup in 2014, where we removed the elected official, the elected uh, president of Ukraine, Yanukovych, on the grounds that he was too pro-Russian, even though he was elected and we imposed our own leadership. So now suddenly the United States is in Ukraine with access to Crimea. And that's why the Russians then took Crimea, because they were never going to let Crimea fall into NATO hands. We had Professor Mearsheimer on our show, I think Jeffrey Sachs as well, explaining all of that history. But most people who were paying attention to Russia and Ukraine only on the day that the Russians invaded believe that history, that history, that conflict began on October, on December, uh, on January 22nd, uh, 2022 because they were encouraged to believe that. But oh, everything was fine, everything was peaceful, and suddenly the Russians invaded in a war of conquest. Exactly the same is happening with October 7th and the Hamas attack on Israel. In fact, just the other day I saw somebody, I don't recall who, participating in a discussion of October 7th. And he was a very pro-Israel advocate. And one of the points he was making was, in response to someone pointing out how devastating the Israeli bombing of Gaza was, he said, well, that only happened because of October 7th. Israel wasn't bombing Gaza prior to October 7th, 2023. And I have a lot of confidence. I'd be willing to bet a lot of money that most people in the United States believe that to be true. That only after the October 7th attack did Israel start bombing Gaza. But if you actually look up just 2023 alone through a Google search, you will find that Israel had been continuously bombing Gaza through 2023, killing huge numbers of civilians, bombing civilian infrastructures and schools, and have been doing so basically for every year since they withdrew their military occupation in 2005. They've been killing people in Gaza at will, and they've been blockading Gaza as well and preventing basic foodstuffs from entering, prohibiting Gazans from leaving in any way, including having bombed their airport. So you're talking about a conflict that was not peaceful, uh, a relationship that was not peaceful, that everyone was in harmony, and then suddenly these evil extremists on October 7th attacked just because they want to murder and they want to be bloodthirsty. I don't know of a single population that would have withstood what the Palestinians have withstood for the last, you can go back, seven decades since the expulsion of the Palestinians from their land that Israel now occupies to say nothing of the brutality of Israeli occupation of the West Bank and Gaza and the blockade of it and the bombing of it. Who would live under the rule of a brutal foreign military in your land that hates you and brutalizes you and kills you whenever it wants, year after year after year after year? So thinking about October 7th, it's extremely important, just like with 9-11 or the Russian invasion and so many other historical events, not to just swallow the propagandistic narrative that has been fed to us that all of this happened out of nowhere, that all of this was entirely unprovoked. And obviously saying that doesn't mean any of those things like 9-11 or October 7th or the Russian invasion were justified. It's just understanding the actual historical context that led to these events that didn't just materialize out of nowhere. Thanks for watching this clip from System Update, our live show that airs every Monday through Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on Rumble. You can catch the full nightly shows live or view the backlog of episodes for free on our Rumble page. You can also find full episodes the morning after they air across all major podcasting platforms, including Spotify and Apple. All the information you need is linked below. We hope to see you there.